Welcome back to Aggressive Mastery. <clears throat> this is my third public dev blog about Roadless and the development of it within the dot sample uh, for on Unity. So uh, first off, I want to say thanks for watching these videos. Uh, you know, it's a pretty small channel, and so to me, uh, whenever I see likes, dislikes, or uh, comments, or even questions about this stuff, it's cool. It's exciting to me. It keeps me going. Uh, so please bring up the questions and. Let's see what I can show you, or what you can show me too. I'm very interested to see the, uh, the stuff you guys are working on too, and have you help me get through this stuff. All right, so last week I had a to-do list. Uh, I posted in the last video about uh, basically they were to get instancing and direct or build some shaders, um, get a wind shader working, get Vegetation Studio to have the camera being assigned, uh, work on AMP imposters, get persistent storage rendering. I will persist, and, and I'm going to go through all these things uh, within the next 10 12 minutes. Uh, get biomes set up for Veg Studio, get Map Magic working, generating colliders for use within trees and other objects. And that's working really well. Do some LOD testing on trees, uh, work on backups for the whole project, and then some stretch goals. So let me see here. I'll go ahead and pop over, lose my head here, or make it smaller, and uh, we can go ahead and start looking at how that stuff changed. Man, how blurry was I? All right, so we're back in the editor here, and what you're seeing is that the <clears throat> existing world that you're used to. Down here I've changed the textures on it. The reason for that is that uh, I built my own shaders. Uh, the detailed portion of the shaders they built in seem to have some errors being thrown and so I just wanted to clear out the project of anything that might um, I mean start clearing out the project of things that I don't need or that I don't understand so I can start to be sure I know what's performing at what level. So <clears throat> if we were to edit the environmental scene, click on one of these objects here, and go take a look at the shader for it. So white box gradient here is the material being used by that by this uh, staircase. Looks like. And I built my own here called Ag HDRP Lit Graph. And what I wanted to do in here is basically just make the most basic shader plus add some uh, wind that I, I uh, got off from Brackies, which I'll put a link to, and you can see it here in the trees. So this uh, wind I added was for grass, but I just went ahead and said, okay, if we can use noise to change uh, positions using a graph, I can just use it for anything. And so let me show you that graph. And what you can do to make graphs <clears throat> is just right click, create, and uh, I think it's in here under shaders, and green. Shader, HDRP, and then you want to do any of these. This is HDRP here is new compared to the FPS sample. The FPS sample just had this selection, this window here. So that's why I'm thinking we probably want to stick in here, but you know, your mileage would vary. So I created a new lit graph. <clears throat> this one right here. You can hit the open shader editor, open a new window, looks like they're open in the background here. And what you're seeing here up top, all of this minus this one. This is all the grass uh, movement stuff, so you don't need any of this if you don't want your uh, environment moving. Below down here is the actual basic shader, and really this lit master is the, um, when you hit a material, you put a shader in there, and you want to put your, do anything to it, the lit master here uh, is where you are putting all those values. And what shader graph lets you do is change the values before it gets to that list ma lit master so you can do stuff to it. Um, and so what is going on here up top is we're adding some noise over a time period and I'll show you the link so you can go watch all this um, so that 
you take your texture and you apply this noise in a specific way to make it so that the bottom of your texture doesn't move much but the top of the texture does move and everything in between does the same and that gives you movement. Um, so I brought this, made this shader for, copied this over for movement then uh, all these are here is three textures, your albedo, your normal and a, a ambient occlusion texture and they're just being pumped into the lit master and not even doing anything to those textures which you could. You could change these textures make the normal change just like you are making the position of the pixels change up above. So that's visual scripting is really cool uh, and simple. And so that one there was made by Brackies, this grass shader. And so I'll put a link to this video where he, he worked it through uh, for you to look at. Go check him out. It's great uh, tutorials. So that would be the shader I worked on. The nice part about this is what I did is uh, right here what a branch is is logic and I basically have a toggle right here uh, a boolean to say do you want to have wind on this shader or not and depending on if I pick yes or no I'll take the modified wind value above if I say yeah I want wind and pass that into the position or I'll take just a static position and pass it in if I don't want wind on my texture. And what that lets me do is on these trees, or right, we'll just do it on this right here. If I went into this box and I sh went down here and I added the wind system to the shader, or just enabled it on the shader for the, tr the uh, well you see the effect. What happens is it's moving all of the placement of the textures. And so by turning that on and off, basically I can uh, get a cool effect. That's pretty trippy too. Alright, so we got that shader done, and that's the wind. So we got instance and direct, I still need to work on, uh, but because what that's going to do is, uh, but I'll go into that in a different video once I get, to, once I get it working. <clears throat> what I can also do with these shaders is I have uh, some additional wind stuff down here that Bracky gave me, so I can uh, Holy smokes, seven minutes. All right. Amp imposters that had some issues, so I'm skipping that for now. It's, I'll probably work on it next week or next video. Persistent storage. All right, let's hit play on this. Uh, persistent storage is a way for Map Maker, which does the terrain, to say where objects are and tell it to Vegetation Studio. So that Vegetation Studio can then make them into entities and then do the fulstrom culling on it and render the trees where I want them. And so we do have that set up. Oh, play mode. Close this, don't save it. All right. So what I have, what I have here in Map Magic, it also has a visual uh, editor. So I'll show the editor on it. Down below here. And you just have basically here is some noise, a curve rounding the noise, and that makes your uh, your land. And then this down here says a slope from 20 to 65. Go ahead and scatter objects in there. Those objects clone them so that half uh, one version of it goes here to map, uh, to Vegetation Studio directly to render it. And then another version of the object, or actually sorry, the top one here. This is my um, collision object which is going to the terrain and then this one here is the Visual Studio tree which is going to Visual Studio's persistent storage. What happens then is I moved all these I have all these tree colliders on the terrain I then move in I went in, into the terrain copied all those tree colliders dragged them into a sub scene here for my primitives uh, sorry for and now I have all these no render meshes attached to a sub scene that just have uh, a box for the tree to collide, be the collider. And you can see there's a fair amount of them all the way down. What that allows me to do, close this out, is that now <coughs> I have. Vegetation Studio just drawing the renderers for the trees where I can see them. 
but then on my server and my clients, the colliders for all the trees are always there. So that way uh, the server will always be able to tell if a bullet hits a tree even if that player can't see it, that type of stuff. Alright, so now we're back in the game here. A uh, key thing to note, if uh, when you're running it, make sure you are always checking. You can see I didn't. Turn off jobs. To go up here, turn off leak detection, and also on burst, make sure you're not doing synchronous compilation. If you do synchronous compilation, it will try and compile everything before the play happens, so you have like a 10 or 15 minute delay versus just an instant play. So make sure you have synchronous compilations turned off. All right, and now that we're in the world, we can come down here and uh, bump into a tree. You can see that. I just didn't want to make all that noise. You can see the shaders moving the tree around. When I get grass in here, it'll move like that, and then the world will be alive, right? Just by the use of shaders to, to do the movement. So yeah, collisions are working. It's running at 60 frames a second in the editor while I'm recording this and all the other stuff. So performance seems to be all right. And if we go back out to the scene, you can take a look here and you can see that as I move the player around, it culls the trees. Uh, additionally, for LOD testing, I did put the standard trees in here that have a bunch of different level of details. I think it was five. And that does slow it down as it's having to cull and then do level of detail for each tree versus just do a single tree for everything. It seems to run better just a single tree instance. All right. Backups. Back up your stuff. I have uh, external USB drives that are simple like this that I uh, pump out the backups to on a daily basis so that if my hard drive craps out or dies, I don't lose everything. Uh, big setbacks like that will set you back. All right, so next one I'm looking at here is to get next video to have amp imposters which is a way to summarize a bunch of uh, models into a single image and use that at far distance. Uh, I'd like to have that working. I'd like to get instance indirect working which would make the performance a little bit better on the trees instead of just instanced. So another way to thin down the copies of trees out in the world and other objects. Um, and then then it's more into the meat and potatoes of, of getting into the, the actual coding. Uh, the one other thing I mentioned on here is that Veg Studio doesn't need to grab the camera, and so I had to make a little script uh, on how to do that. And here's that script. All I do in this script is make sure I have the namespaces so that I can have the script set on the Veg Studio. I then go ahead and check on a late update. This is bad. This is not dots. This is uh, mono behavior stuff. But on late update, I check to see if there, if I have a camera object or not. I'm going to make this run just on the client rather than on the server and pull off Veg Studio doesn't need to be on the server and uh, this doesn't need to be on the server, but on the client it does since that's where rendering is done. <clears throat> so I see if I have a camera object. If I don't, I find it, the player clone, which is what happens when the game starts is you get this player camera clone uh, spawned in the world. You can see that from the editor. Uh, so I grab that. If it's not null, meaning I found the camera, then I'll go ahead and assign it, and that's all the script does. It's just grab the camera when it, when it starts. And as you saw when we hit play, it works because initially the camera's not on Veg Studio. You look at this, the game object, the game's here, and you'll see no trees, but then it'll flash and all the trees will be there. So that's cool. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks for uh, coming and watching again. I'll see you next time. Oh, see? Nothing? Boom! Trees! <laughs> Ciao.